Well, good morning, Woodland. I get a special privilege this morning. Uh, my name is Jack Lynn, and I'm the interim lead pastor here. And uh, unless you want to introduce me during the run through before the service, one of the staff members introduced me and said, he's the old bald guy that's going to get up there. So you can do that too. Uh, but uh, I am, I'm really excited about a special privilege that I have this morning. And I want to take a little special privilege somewhere, I think back here, my wife and daughter and son are there. Guys, would you stand up just a minute? Come on. Yeah, there's my wife and daughter. And yeah, Rachel and Brian, and my wife is Michelle. And right down front is another one of my daughters, Hannah, who is right down front here, uh, which you've met her, I think. Um, so guys, thanks for being here. Uh, I get the privilege this morning of introducing Pastor Mason uh, for this message. One of the things that I love about this church, one of the many things, is they are investing in the next generation of preachers. So a couple of weeks ago, Lane Gordon preached, and it was, there was an investment in preparing him and helping him, and, and, and he came and served us well in sharing the Word of God with us today. And today, Pastor Mason, who is our young adult and student pastor, is going to be bringing the word, continuing this series uh, about David. And I'm excited about that. Yesterday, I was a little nervous that he might not be able to preach today because of how close the Michigan-Ohio State game was. And he is a diehard Michigan fan, and I, I texted... I texted to see if his heart was still pumping, and Hannah answered and said, barely. Uh, so, yeah, it's just, it's just a fun thing. I have known Mason since he was in high school, and just a few years ago, I had the special privilege of conducting the wedding of Mason and our daughter, Hannah. So Mason is my son-in-law, and so I'm excited about being able to introduce him. Here's what I want to tell you that's really probably most important Number one, he's a dead serious Christ follower. Number two, he is a serious student of the Word of God. And he is really serious about sharing the Word of God with other people. Mm -hmm. I am so pumped about that and so glad that we have a generation of people who are deeply committed to that. So would you help me this morning to welcome Pastor Mason as he comes and shares? Thank you. Love you, <laughs> oh, well, good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your Thanksgiving. And as Jack said, some of us were a little bit extra thankful this weekend that the Wolverines got the W. Yeah, so excited about that. Awesome game. If you don't know me, once again, my name is Mason Rosado. I get the privilege and honor of serving here as our student and young adult pastor. It's been such a joy to get to know this next generation. I believe this next generation is hungry for a move of God in our time, in our day. And I love having the opportunity of blessing and serving them. My wife Hannah and I, we moved here to Battle Creek um, a couple of months ago, but we spent the past four years in a small town in Indiana called Greentown. We had a great time there, um, but both of us, we actually grew up in Holland, Michigan, and so we are very thrilled and excited to be back in the mitten. And we've been walking through this series on David the past couple of weeks, and what we've seen is that what's most honorable and what's most admirable about David is his heart that is after God's own heart. His heart was so centered on giving God a resting place here on earth, a place where God is seen and known and felt. And we're introduced to David as this shepherd boy who's tending his father's sheep. And later Jewish teachers, they would look back on the stories of people like David, the people like Moses, and they would say, when God looks for a leader, he examines how he takes care of his sheep. And so David begins in these humble beginnings, taking care of his father's sheep. I mean, we see David and just his confidence in God is so awe-inspiring. His words to the giant Goliath were, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, 
the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. We see this raw and authentic heart of worship that we find in the Psalms that we've all come to know and love. And on our best days, we can relate to this side of David. This side of David who is so filled with faith, who's willing to stand up against the injustice and idolatry of the world. And the boy David, whose name means beloved, he starts in very humble beginnings and will one day become king over all of God's people. These stories of humility, they shine through in David's life. And these are the things that we love about him. And of course, there are the things that aren't so good in David's life. I mean, 90% of people will read the first couple of chapters of the story of David. They'll see his anointing by Samuel and God among the shepherd, among the sheep. And they'll see his story of his battle with Goliath. And they'll read through the story of, you know, his battle with Goliath. And they'll say, that was That was a great story, but it was kind of long. It was 50 or 60 verses long. And so many of us will park there and fail to read the rest of the story. And so understandably, we'll jump to exalting the King David. We will exalt him for his humility and his heart that's after God, but we fail to often see that David is also a very flawed and broken individual. And we can be incredibly thankful this morning that God is with and God works through incredibly flawed and broken individuals of which I am one of them. And if we're honest, I think so many of us can relate more often to the brokenness of David than even his faith and his confidence in God. And towards the end of David's life, If we read the story of David, we're left with more questions than answers about his character and his heart. How could a man who has such a heart after God do so much evil? David's heart is divided in this story and so often in life, if we're honest, so is ours. So many of us, David included, can relate to St. Augustine's words when he said, my inner self was a house divided against itself. So many of us deal with these conflicting desires and so did David. And today we're gonna look closely at a story that gives us insight into King David's heart. What does the shepherd boy do when he's the king in charge? Will David the king end his life with the vibrant heart of worship just in the same way he started? Today we're gonna look at David and what he cares about and what he values so that it can give us insight into what we care about and what we value. And the question I wanna ask you today is this, what do you value? What do you care about? And what we value and what we care about is often expressed by anything that we give our time or attention or money towards. What we value is often expressed by anything that we give our time or money or attention towards. And one of my favorite authors on spiritual formation, John Mark Comer, he says this about worship and value. He says, worship and joy start with the capacity to turn our mind's attention towards the God who's always with us in the now. As apprentices of Jesus, as people who are learning from Jesus, this is our main task and the locus of the devil's stratagem against us. In other words, this is where the battle is fought. The battle is for turning our attention and our minds on Jesus in every day of our lives, in every action that we do, and with every desire that we have. And our values and our desires are being formed and shaped by what we give our attention to, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not. And the story that we're gonna walk through today can give us insight into what David values by what he gives his time, his money, and his attention towards. And so if you have your Bibles with you today, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21 is where we're gonna be hanging out this morning. And 
in this story, as David is nearing the end of his life, his life has been so full of trials, so full of difficulty, full of wars and battles, but it's also been full and saturated with God's presence. As the scriptures say, the Lord was with David. And now that David is king, what does David the king value most? The story that asks the question of what David values is found in 1 Chronicles 21, and it starts like this. It says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan. Then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. And there are many questions that we can ask at the beginning of this chapter. But one of the questions that I want to ask is, why might a king want to take a census? Why might a king want to count the people that are within his territory and The phrase Beersheba to Dan is a phrase that was used to to include all of the kingdom of Israel. Dan was in the northernmost part of Israel, and Beersheba was in the southernmost part of Israel. We have a little map there. And so what David wanted to know was how many people are underneath the reign of my rule. And And a king might want to take a census for two main reasons. Number one, just like the text says, he wants to know how many people there are. He wants to know how many military troops there are. He wants to know if the people within his kingdom are supporting him in battle. He wants to know if they're supporting David in his efforts against people like the Philistines and the Jebusites of his day. But also, David wants to take a census because David wants to know if he's getting financially Contributed to or not, if he's getting financially contributed to or not. He wants to know if he's getting his taxes or not. As a king, he wants to make sure that he's getting his money. He wants to make sure that he's financially secure. And towards the end of David's life, if we were to ask the question, what does David the king value? Well, by this story, we might say that David the king, what he values is his own financial and security and the stability for his future. He values his own self and his own stability over and above his faithfulness to God. And if this story is any witness, sometimes the voice that tells us you need to provide for yourself, you need to make sure that you get yours, Sometimes and most often times, that voice is the voice of the enemy. David, at this point in his life, he wants to ride into the sunset with flying financial colors. He's planning for his retirement. And at the very moment that David decides that he's someone who values his own security, his own stability over and above his faithfulness to God, God interrupts and disrupts his plans. And here's the second thing that we can learn from this story. God will interrupt our lives so that he can reset our values. God will interrupt our lives so that he can reset our values. Has God ever, re- has God ever interrupted your plans to reset your values? In this story, God gives David three options as a consequence of his actions. I mean, just like Burger King, the prophet Gad tells him, you can have it your way. And Gad tells him that he's going to get either three years of famine, three months of running away from his enemies, or he's going to get three days of a plague, the sword of the Lord ravaging through the land of Israel. And there are always consequences to our actions. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But in this situation, the consequences of David's actions are extremely bad for the people that he's leading, the sheep that he's shepherding. And David answers God by choosing the plague. He says this, he says, I'm in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is very great, but do not let me fall into human hands. 
What do you do when God interrupts your life so that he can reset, change, and realign what we value? What do we do in those situations where God is allowing us to go through the difficult and painful process as he performs heart surgery on what we care about and what we value? Better yet, are you in a season where you feel some extra conviction on some actions or habits or desires that you have where God is looking to change and reform? Do you give God the freedom to do something in your life that you're frustrated with and that you don't necessarily like? Because if we don't give God the freedom to step into our lives and to do something we don't necessarily like, the reality is it's not any longer God that we're serving. The person that we're serving is our own selfish ambitions and our desires. And so what do you do in these situations? King David, he teaches us that in these difficult times where God is reforming and reshaping and realigning our values, King David teaches us that it's time to throw our hands into the mercy of the Lord. It's time to throw ourselves completely on God for his mercy is very great. And God gives David the consequences and they completely cut all of David's aspirations for his financial stability and his military security. And what happens next in the story is a plague ravages throughout all of the land of Israel. All those people that David was hoping to receive support and tribute from, they begin to be devastated by a plague. And we read that 70,000 people die as a result of this plague. David grew up tending sheep and even fighting for sheep. But what David didn't realize is that forcing your own sheep to support you and to contribute to you, that doesn't fit within God's value system. That doesn't fit within God's will. And what happens next in the story is almost as if it comes out of a movie. We could probably see this scene on the big screen. And so we pick up in the story on 1 Chronicles 21 in verse 15. And so if you could go ahead and bounce with me down to the end of verse 15, it says this, the angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with a drawn sword in his hand extended over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell face down. David said to God, was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Lord, my God, let your hand fall on me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. Then the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that Gad had spoken in the name of the Lord. And while Aruna was threshing wheat, he turned and saw the angel, his four sons who were with him, hid themselves. Then when David approached and when Aruna looked and saw him, he left the threshing floor and bowed down before David with his face to the ground. David said to him, let me have the sight of your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at the full price. The shepherd boy, the tender of sheep, he fails and he falls short. In other words, his values give way to actions that harm those underneath his care. And in modern life, we, we might think that it's wise or fair or just that a king might want to know that everybody underneath his kingdom is giving him support. We might think that it's fair and wise for a king to know if everyone's contributing their fair share. 
But what God wanted out of David at this point in his life was a king that valued and trusted in God's provision even more than his own leadership, even more than the stability and security of his finances or his military, his net worth and his nest egg. And at this point in his life, David is called to die to self and to pray, to intercede on behalf of his sheep. In the words of Leonard Cohen, David is offering his broken hallelujah. And in a manner much like Jesus will, David is even willing to let the plague fall on himself. And David is called up by the prophet, the seer Gad to go and pray. And I believe that the Lord this morning is calling his people to pray just like David. He's calling us to value seeking his presence in the place of prayer. And as we look at the many current events in this world, the many things that are happening in our city, the many things that are happening even in our very church, it can be very easy and convenient to have some strong opinions about what people in positions of leadership ought to do. But what David reminds us in this story is that the first place we should all go with all of our desires to change the world is to the place of prayer, seeking Jesus and valuing him deeply. And the place where God was bringing David in his life was back to a familiar place. God was bringing David back to his hands and knees in prayer and in sacrifice. And the image of the threshing floor is an image that was common in this day. And the threshing floor was used by wheat farmers to separate the wheat from the chaff. The threshing floor was used to separate what was inedible, not valuable, and not usable away from what was valuable, usable, and edible. The threshing floor is used to separate the wheat from the chaff. And this would happen in two primary ways. They would use a threshing sledge, often pulled by an ox. We have a picture there for it, that plank of wood there. And the threshing sledge would be pulled across both the wheat and the chaff in order to separate it. And you can see that this picture on the, the right here is the, the picture of what's on the bottom of the threshing sledge. There would often be hard pieces of rock or glass or metal in order to separate the wheat from the chaff. And then the wheat farmers would often go in with a winnowing fork, another term that we see in scripture, and they would grab a clump of the wheat and the chaff and they would throw it up. And what would happen naturally is that the wind would separate the lighter chaff all that stuff that we can't use, we can't eat, we can't do anything with. And what would happen is the heavier, more valuable wheat would drop to the ground so that the farmer could gather them into his barn so that he could feed his family. And this is often, this is actually what John the Baptist will call Jesus. For example, John the Baptist will describe Jesus this way. He'll say that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. And so Jesus this morning is a threshing floor. Jesus is a winnowing fork and he gathers all of those people who he loves, who cling to him in faith and trust and the rest, all of the sin, all the brokenness of the world is burned away like chaff. And what's happening in this passage in 1 Chronicles 21 is that David himself is the one being sifted. David's on the threshing floor. And David's desires are being sifted through to see what he really cares about and what he values most. What's at the core of his heart? 
and the angel of the Lord draws attention to what needs to happen in David's heart. Is David just interested in the perks of being king, the financial benefits of the king's throne? Or is he truly devoted to God? Is he truly devoted to God's resting place and God's people? And this will actually happen in another place in scripture. For example, Jesus will tell Peter, he'll, he'll say that Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Isn't it good to know that when we're going through seasons where God is sifting us, we have a high priest in Jesus who's praying for us. I believe it is good news this morning. And both Peter and David were sifted as wheat. And at the outset, both David and Peter were found out to be people who, if we're honest, they valued their own security, their own stability, over and above being close to God, over and above their intimacy with Jesus in difficult times, over and above interceding and praying for God's people. And so in whatever stage of life you find yourself in this morning, how do you find yourself yielding to the sifting process? Better yet, are you aware of the fact that God is the one who is sifting you? How do we react when God draws attention to those places in our hearts that need to be blown away like chaff in the wind? Do we trust God in this difficult and painful pruning process of our hearts? Can we let God do the hard work of sifting through our hearts and sifting through our values, letting him separate the wheat from the chaff in our thoughts, in our actions, in our desires? Jesus can be trusted when our desires are being sifted through, when our desires are being pruned so that we can experience more of his life. Jesus will say that he prunes whatever branch in him bears fruit so that it can be even more fruitful. We go through this pruning and sifting so that we can experience more of his life, more of his peace, more of his goodness. And the story continues and it ends like this in 1 Chronicles 21. In verse 23, it says, Aruna said to David, take it. Let my Lord the king do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give all of this. But King David replied to Aruna, no, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David paid Aruna 600 shekels of gold for the site. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He called on the Lord and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. And then the Lord spoke to the angel and he put his sword back into its sheath. And David will actually decide a few verses later at the beginning of the next chapter that this place where the plague is stopped and this place where sacrifices are being offered, this is gonna be the place where God's temple will be built. In verse one of the next chapter, it says, then David said, the house of the Lord God is to be here and also the altar of burnt offering for Israel. David is brought to a place where he values God and values his resting place. David is sifted as wheat, so at the core of who he is could be revealed. Someone who values God to the tune of 600 shekels of gold. He's stripped of his former pride and he yields everything to God in humility. David will not offer up a meaningless offering, one that doesn't cost him anything, one that doesn't cost him something in his heart. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that to follow God closely in this season, it might cost us something. 
It might, might cost us some free time. It might even cost us some friends. It might cost us some financial security. Drawing near to God in this season might require sifting through some Netflix binging, some sifting through of some social media scrolling to let that chaff fall away so that the wheat of spending time with the Lord in the place of prayer, the wheat of spending time with the Lord in the place of scripture can be revealed. And when God wants to associate intimately and powerfully with a people group, with a person and a place, God brings his fire. And that's what he does in this chapter. And if we were to ask the question, what does God value above all else? We could answer by saying God values his presence among his people. When the desires of humanity and the desires of God, when they come into alignment, the result is the fire of God's presence. In Psalm 132, it details David's desire for God's resting place and his presence among his people. It says of David that he swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. And what this world needs most, more than anything else, is people with the desire and the zeal of King David to find God a resting place here on earth. What we need more than anything else is a move of God in our midst. One thing David said, this only do I ask that I may seek the presence of the Lord and to gaze on him in his temple. And when we want what he wants, the result is God's glorious presence among his people. And for your reference, it's noted in 2 Chronicles 3, verse 1, that Solomon would later build the temple here on this threshing floor. And this threshing floor is also the place where Abraham was called to willingly offer up his son as a sacrifice. This threshing floor is also known as Mount Moriah. And this is the same story in David's life about God's grace meeting us even when we were deserving of his judgment, even when we were deserving of the plague. And in this story, what David intended for bad, the census, God intended for good, the birthplace of the temple. And in our story, even when we were deserving of death, even when we deserve to be blown away like chaff in the wind because of our lack of trust in God, a lamb was slain in our place. There was a sacrifice that was made so that we could be forgiven and free. There was a sacrifice that was offered up so that we could know God and enjoy his presence. And the reality that we all step into this morning is that John 3, 16 reality that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The plague was headed our way, but Jesus stepped in our place and died the death that we deserved. David is a great individual. And I'm so grateful that we can learn about him and read these stories of him in the scriptures. We can learn about his humble beginnings. We can learn about his authentic worship. We can learn how he fought battles. But what's most honorable about David is his humble response to his own sin and brokenness. And that's what I love the most. He let God draw attention to those areas in his heart that were rebellious. And what King David really helps us understand this morning is that we're never going to find life in any human leader, whether governor or president 
or lead pastor or boss. We all need Jesus deeply. And David points us to our need for Jesus, the one true son of David, the one true king. And many Christians around the world today, they commemorate Christ the King Sunday, celebrating the fact that Jesus is king of over the whole earth. And from eternity and into today, there has been a king who has truly valued and cared for you. His name is Jesus. Jesus, the one who said, I have come to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus, the shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesus, the one who is the Lamb of God, the sacrifice slain to finally stop the plague of sin the one true king who purchased you, not with the blood of rams or bulls or goats, but with the precious and spotless blood of the lamb, Jesus has freed you this morning. We need Jesus. And as we head into this Advent season, I don't want you to be caught off guard. I don't want you to be mistaken. Jesus values you. Jesus cares about you. And he longs to dwell in your heart by faith. God wants your heart. God values your heart. And David is brought to this place where he needs the Lord. But that doesn't mean it wasn't painful or costly for him. And that means for us this morning, as painful and as costly as it might be, we might need to die to ourselves so that we can truly receive all that God has for us. We need Jesus as we head into this Advent season. How badly do you desire him? How much do you yearn for his presence? Let me pray for you this morning. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for your heart that's after our heart. Lord, I thank you that you care about each one of us in the room. I thank you that you have longed to set your presence among your people. And Lord, I pray that tonight, today, Lord, you would set our hearts on fire for prayer that we would seek your presence, that we would seek your face. Lord, I love you and I pray that you would continue to show yourself and show your presence among us in great and mighty ways. We thank you for who you are, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen, amen. Thank you.